Did you catch all that? Church, did you catch all that? All right, I'm going to keep asking till I get a better response. Did you catch all that? Some of you are sitting there like this, like, I'm not going to show you any enthusiasm. Praise the Lord. This is Wave Church, 1000 North Great Neck Road. Did you come to the right church this morning? <laughs> All right. I want to mention a couple of things real quick. I need my, my, uh, my what do you call it? My iPodium. I guess that's what you call it. It's, it's an iPad and it's a podium. So it's an iPodium. Did I just make up a word? Because I'm good at that. All right. A couple of things I want to mention. And, and we, before we let all the kids go, I think, right, Josh? We want to mention a couple of things that are just new and exciting in Wave Church. We're connected to Seaboard Road. Good morning, Joe, Lauren, and all the Wave family. Come on. Can we welcome our Seaboard Road campus? Always glad to have you online watching every single Sunday. And, of course, all the people watching all over the world, all of our military. A couple of things I want to mention that we're actually making some, as a result of just great uh, movement and growth and strategy across all that is WAVE. Do you know we have WAVE Church? We have WAVE campuses in seven locations. We've got WAVE Online. We've got WAVE TV. We've got WAVE Leadership College. We've got WAVE Children's Learning Center. We've got WAVE City Care. I mean, sometimes I think to myself, dear God, well, I, I've lost sight of all these things myself. But the moment you make maybe a change in one area, it actually opens the door for change in a lot of areas. So recently we actually have moved uh, Chuck Chafont, who's been our pastoral care director right here at Great Neck, into working in our Wave Leadership College as the, I think it's, a, I'm going to give him a new title if I'm not careful, but... It's the Dean of Students. That's what I thought it was, Jordan. And uh, as a result of that, we actually wanted to make sure that we actually brought in some fresh leadership into that. Chuck also was overseeing our community groups. So we're actually announcing today some new exciting changes. You ready for it? You ready for it? So number one, the first thing we're announcing is that Luke Llewellyn will be moving into the role as our youth pastor, into the role of our community groups pastor. And he will be doing that. So let's congratulate. Where are you, Luke? They stand up, Luke, so people know who you are. He's done an amazing job pastoring our young people. And he'll be also running, moving into a role as the young adults uh, youth pastor. But Josh, of course, will still be very much involved in the sex and the preaching and the leading of that. But Luke will be the day-to-day -day guy responsible for all of our young adults. So congratulations, Luke. I'm excited for you and for Katie and believe you'll do a fantastic job. And that's a result of Chuck moving into another area of what is WAVE. And then on top of that, we now need to think about who would be our youth pastor that would oversee all of WAVE. And I want to announce today in Seaboard Road, I want you to give a special cheer to Caleb Cox. Is he here this morning? Come up here, Caleb, real quick. Come up here real fast. Praise the Lord. Caleb, as anybody knows, Caleb has been serving faithfully in our youth ministry. And the reports I hear of what this guy has been doing and Seaboard Road, let me tell you, has been amazing. And uh, I just want to congratulate you. And I, actually, I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to make sure at our next um, sixth service, we're going to take some time to have what I would call an ordination service for these changes. And we want to lay hands on you and on Luke. But I want you to know, Great Nick, the reason why I got uh, Caleb up here is a lot of you may not even know his face. Uh, Luke, we know his face. Praise the Lord. And Caleb, what I love about you, as far as I know, you have no tattoos. Praise the Lord. So, man, that's a... A you pastor without, how many think that's a good thing? Would you keep it that way for me for no other reason? Would you, would you make that commitment to your pastor today? Oh, I'm telling you, Josh, he gets a pay rise. All right, so congratulate Caleb. Come on. And while we're making all the announcements, there's a young man who I have watched for several years. And now we're looking at Wave Seaboard. And of course, we want to make sure everything moves forwards in strides. And there's a young man I've been watching for years, deliberately and intentionally, really believing he's got a great future with us. But I've watched this young man serve in obscurity. He reminds me of David as the shepherd boy. And I watched him handle taking the little tasks that maybe, maybe people don't notice. But let me tell you, 
I've noticed, and I'm announcing today that who will be running our youth ministry down in Seaboard Road is Devonte Thomas. Come up here, Devonte. I want people to know who Devonte is. And also, uh, can, and Janie, where are you, Janie? Are you are you here this morning? She's at she's at Seaboard. So she's at Joe. Get Janie up on the stage down there because this here, this young man, let me tell you, is an amazing man of God. He has been serving in our college and actually doing part of your internship. A lot of people want to be the internship of being on the music team or maybe in an area of youth ministry and creative team. You know, the areas that maybe you get an opportunity to preach and lead in different spheres. Do you know where he did his internship? He actually did his internship in our maintenance and facilities department and faithfully served. And I've been asking our team, how's he doing? I've watched him with his leadership. He's a people gatherer. And I want to tell you, we're going to pray over you on our next six Sunday night service. Congratulations. Do you have any tattoos? Praise the Lord. Would you make a promise to your pastor? Josh, he's out of here in two weeks. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Caleb would, but Devonte wouldn't. But I just took note of that. Praise the Lord. And uh, what I want to do is just let you all know, because these are all great decisions, great opportunities, and we are committed to Seaboard. Thank you for raising up such an amazing young man called Caleb and giving him the opportunity for his ministry gift in this. And I just want to say, despise not. You know, don't don't feel like, oh, we don't have Caleb anymore. Caleb is actually going to be you pastor of all, and he'll be jealously watching out for everything and everybody, parents especially. Let me tell you something. Devonte is a great man of God. And as a parent, I always ask myself, would I feel comfortable with this person leading? And uh, number one, I ask myself, do I trust the leadership of the church? That they see something in somebody. And I've got to tell you, there are times as a youth pastor, let me tell you something, where some, some people didn't like the fact that I was the youth pastor. And, uh, but I've got to tell you, all I want to say to you is, just don't be that kind of person. I know what it's like to be on that end of it. And I'm telling you, it's not fun. And uh, what's really funny is these young people, um, they, they, they love God. And, and uh, they repeat everything parents tell them to the youth pastor. I think one of my favorite moments, I had this guy who told me he's been free from alcohol, which he didn't have to tell me, but he's telling me he is. And he wanted me to know that he hadn't been drinking for a while. And I said, well done, man, that's awesome. We're working together in carpentry in the church. And all of a sudden, I walked up to this guy and I needed a piece of uh, four by two, piece of timber, you know, four by two, do you use that expression, four by two? And so... What is it? Two by four. It's two by four. And we're in Australia, we're underneath. So it's four by two. And uh, anyway, so I said, hey, man, have you got a a two by four? And uh, and he goes, oh, I don't. And then the son says, dad, your fridge is full of twoies too, which is a beer in Australia. He goes, Dad, you got plenty of that at home. I just laughed. I love young people, don't you? They're so honest. The dad died a thousand deaths because the words that were coming out of his mouth were quite different from what his son was just telling me. And I just love it. So congratulations to all of them. Youth camp is coming up. And I, I was just in Richmond, and I was actually talking to a young man who'd never set foot in church, but he came to our youth camp last year. And then I want to show you, I just quickly got a video. It's a really rough video. It, this is my recording. This is not the media team. You with me here? This is your pastor doing the most hopeless recording ever, but it tells the story. Check it out. So here I am. I'm at Wave Richmond tonight, and I've just talked to a young man whose name is Parks and at Wave Richmond, and from what I understand, the first time you ever went to church was last year at our youth camp, and now you're plugged in the church, one of our young leaders, so I'm going to just get you to say hi, Parks. Hi, how are you? What would you encourage young people who are thinking about whether they should or shouldn't go to youth camp? What would you say to them? I would definitely go to youth camp. It changes everything. I mean, like, your entire outlook on life has changed. And this is Mum. Hi. Mum, what would you say to parents who are thinking about whether they should or shouldn't send their youth. What's your story now? That you've, how's he changed? So our experience as a family with Parks going to youth, youth camp led us to an entire family of coming to Wave Church, an entire family of being more living in the kingdom of God, having a community, having a church home, everything does. So you came to church after he came? 
Um, I moved from Washington State 15 yeah. years ago, wow. had no church home, went to a lot of places that I didn't feel the presence of God. Right. And after him coming back from youth group or youth camp, yeah. we came together that Sunday and I went, this is home. This is our home. Did you hear that? It was actually his God encounter that brought a God encounter to the whole family. So come on, parents. I tell you, it's worth the investment to pay the money, get your kids to youth camp. If you can't afford it, you know us. We'd never let that be a reason why somebody couldn't or wouldn't go to camp. So awesome. Youth camp coming up. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be amazing. Youth camp. I'm speaking at it on the Friday night. And so I just want to encourage every parent who's got young people the age of youth camp. Number one, for all the summer programs that you commit your kids to, there's probably nothing more important than a youth camp. I just want to say it again, because I actually really mean this. There's probably something, nothing more important than a summer youth cramp, uh, camp, cramp, a youth cramp. <laughs> they, they do happen at youth camp. But I want to tell you, for all the sports and academia and all the pursuits and all the desires you have for your young people, there could be nothing greater than to be touched by the presence of God. You need to get them there before, before you, if you have a choice, between them going to youth camp and some other program, as your pastor, I will tell you, I am the product of a changed life by being at youth camp. I'm telling you, there is nothing more powerful. There's no greater prayer you could pray than they get a hold of God. So I just want to encourage everybody in Seaboard. And right now, we got to dismiss all the kids. So come on, let's all stand to our feet. We've been sitting down for at least 15 minutes now. And give all the kids and all of our middle schoolers with Luke Llewellyn and Devante and Janine and all the team, give them a big cheer as they head on out. Amen. Father, as we just come around your word now, I ask you, Lord, in this summer season, I believe this is a word for the summer season. I thank you, Lord, it's not just a good word, but it's a word that will speak to each and every one of us. I know it will. So Lord, bless your word, we pray. And everybody said, amen. You can be seated. Everybody say, almost persuaded almost persuaded. How many have almost been persuaded to change jobs? Who's almost been persuaded to change jobs? Who's almost been persuaded to buy a house or move house? Anybody almost, almost persuaded? Or oh, maybe you went to a car dealership and you were almost persuaded to buy that car. Anybody here know what it's like to be almost persuaded? No one's gonna lift their hands. This is 1,000 North Great Neck Road. Just want to make sure this is not the church of the chosen frozen. Who's ever been almost persuaded? Maybe a salesperson comes to your door and in that moment, you are almost persuaded. I want to show you someone in the Bible and I actually want to launch into our summer as this, yes, I think two days ago was the first day of summer. Is that right? And so I want to make sure that we stay on a summer soul winning offensive at Wave Church. As we go into our summer season, that we don't just, you know, in the break mentality, in the vacation season, that whilst we actually are in the summer season, we don't get restful when it comes to our love for God and seeing people knowing Jesus. Amen. Nothing wrong with going on a vacation. Just don't go on a vacation from Jesus. Amen. And so I was thinking about different people in the Bible and I was thinking about when Paul was talking to King Agrippa and I want to talk about him this morning. There's nothing worse than being almost saved. Imagine your testimony was, I was almost healed. I was almost blessed. I was almost delivered. I was almost saved. And I want to look at that this morning. And I believe with all my heart that we are called as Christians to be persuaders. Amen. Okay. 1000 North Great Neck Road. Okay. So if I go to your house, like I was at Gay's house last night, and, and, and I didn't just sit there. And, and when, you know, if I'm the guest, you're up here, and I'm at her, Imagine if Gay talked to me and I just didn't say anything. That would be rude, wouldn't it? Okay. So here we are in God's house. I'm having a conversation. So I'm looking for you to respond, to feedback with me. Is that okay? So let me just try this again. Uh, how many of you know we are called to be persuaders? Do you believe that's true? 
I, I believe with all my heart we are called to be persuaded. As a matter of fact, Jesus was persuasive. And I want you to look at this here because there's a great story in the Bible in John 6, verse 67. And it says, so Jesus said to the 12, watch this. Do you want to leave me as well? And Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. Jesus had said some things that actually turned people off. And the Bible says that multitudes left him, that crowds left him. I've learned over many years of Christian life, crowds come and crowds go. Are you hearing me? And I've never learned to be affected by the crowds, whether they be great crowds or small crowds. What matters is, is God in the meeting. Are you hearing me? And I just want to say this, that Jesus had said something along the lines of what we just took, did this morning in communion. And he said something, if you read your Bible, you'll know what he said. And you can read it for yourself because I like to provoke people to know their Bible. But actually, as a result of it, people just left, stage left, exit, snaggle puss, see ya, wouldn't want to be ya. And Jesus was so noticing how many people left that it looked like the only people that were left were his disciples. So Jesus says, do you want to leave as well? And Jesus was so persuasive that Peter said, Lord, who else can we go to? Only you have the words of eternal life. There's something that connected with these disciples that even though they didn't understand everything Jesus said, but we are persuaded that he has the words of eternal life and we will figure it out. We will understand because we're following Jesus. Watch this now. Here is a temple guard, a soldier, if you like, that was sent to arrest Jesus because the high priests and the Pharisees were so upset with him. So the Bible says in John 7, verse 32, I just want to lay the foundation. We are called to be persuasive. You're not persuading me that you believe what I'm saying right now. We are called to be persuasive. And it says, says the Pharisees heard the crowd whispering, John 7, verse 32, such things about him. So the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. So the Pharisees and, and the, the high priest had guards. It's like who's ever been to the Vatican and seen the temple guards in the Vatican? You don't dare say anything out of place in the Vatican. You don't dare go anywhere in the Vatican that you're not supposed to go. Or the temple guards will let you know. I experienced it firsthand when I shouted hallelujah in the Sistine Chapel. And I had the temple guards go, silencio, silencio. Even I who don't speak Italian know what that word means. Shut up. Thank God we belong in a church. We're allowed to say amen, even though half of you don't. Thank God we're allowed to be in a church. We're allowed to respond to the Word of God. Thank God we belong to a church where we can interact with the Word of God, say amen to the Word of God, participate with the Word of God, hear the Word of God, create an atmosphere of faith for other people to hear the Word of God. Thank God we're a part of a church that lifts our hands as the Bible says. Come on, there ought not to be silence in the house of God. So I don't know how to put it. It'd be like maybe Seth Mozell. Set up, Seth. Seth's the head of our security team, and he's got a whole group of people. Josh introduced me, someone this morning, who's just joined our security team. His name's Sam. Where's Sam? Is he in the building somewhere? Praise the Lord. He's probably out doing his rounds, knowing Sam. Is he here, Seth? Is he in the building? He's in the lobby where he belongs, I guess. Praise the Lord. And, uh, but it'd be like somebody on security team. But this guy is... The Pharisee temple guard. Have you got it? Thank you, Seth. By the way, can we show our love for the security team? Kim Thummel. Don't mess with that girl. I'm telling you right now. So it says, and it says, they, and they sent this guard to arrest him. Finally, verse 45, the temple guards came back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked him, well, why didn't you bring him in? Because he was sent to arrest Jesus. You got it? And, and they said, why didn't you bring him in? And he goes, oh, yeah, no one has ever spoken like this man does, the guard replied. You, you mean he's deceived you also? The Pharisees reported. Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. I want you to hear this. Here is a temple guard. 
I, I don't know what, what, what his probably rank was, but I imagine he's pretty high ranking in the temple guard. You know, what's the word I'm looking for? Hierarchy. And so he's sent out by the chief priest and by the Pharisees to arrest Jesus. And as he hears Jesus speak, he's so taken with the words of Jesus that he literally forgot what he was there to do. And just so taken by his words and so in thought and so changed and compelled and convinced and persuaded that he literally forgot what he was there to do. Now, you can ask Josh, my son, who was a man of his own right nowadays, and you can say to Josh, hey, Josh, could you go to the refrigerator and bring me some milk or bring me a Coke? And Josh, halfway to the refrigerator, will forget what it is that he was supposed to do in the first place. Anybody know that kind of a person? But here is a temple guard who was sent to arrest Jesus, and he so was taken by the words of Jesus that he literally forgot what he was there to do. And so compelled and so challenged by his words that when he literally gets back to his post and he's standing duty, back of where he's supposed to be, they go, where is he? And in that moment he goes, who? Like, could you imagine? And they went, Jesus, we sent you, oh, yeah. Hey, nobody ever spoke like this man. He was sent to arrest Jesus, but instead he was arrested by Jesus' words. I pray we're those sorts of Christians. Come on, somebody. I pray Seaboard Road. I pray we're the kind of people who actually are persuasive with our words and more than with our words, with our lifestyle. Who can say amen? Let me show you a story here in the Bible of the Apostle Paul real quick. Acts, 28, Acts 26, verse 1. Then King Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Let me just break into the story. This is the Apostle Paul who's been accused falsely, who's been imprisoned and has been beaten. And then as a result of that, he appeals for justice because he's been wrongly accused. He's been wrongly imprisoned and he appeals to Caesar. And of course, as a result of that, they have to now find out who the Apostle Paul is. And finding out the tribe and the, his pedigree, they had to do right by this man. And there was, there seemed to be an injustice that was served to him. And Paul had the right to claim to the highest courts. Are you hearing me? Are you hear and Paul's not dumb. He realizes if I get to the highest courts, I'm speaking to the most influential people. He wasn't just going to drag out the process for being a victim or a martyr. He wanted to speak to the most powerful, influential people. And if this is the way he can get an audience with them, let it be. I mean, some of us, I sometimes hear youth pastors and they go, oh man, I'm burnt out, I'm tired. Not our youth pastors. But I hear people say, I'm tired. Maybe a creative worship leader. I just, oh, I'm just tired. I'm going, dude, have you been in prison lately? Are you hearing me? I'm burnt out. You're not burnt out? When the Bible says you'll be ready to go to heaven, because Jesus will say to you, well done, you're medium rare. You're just getting started. Amen. Come on, some of you, you're a tough crowd. I'm, I'm telling you. Praise, I, I preach better if you laugh at my jokes. And he says, King Agrippa said to Paul, because this is on his way to Caesar, and he's talking now to the king. And he says, you have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. King Agrippa, watch this. I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, especially so because you are well acquainted with the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Give me an ear. Listen to me. The Jewish people all know the way that I have lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that I conform to the strictest sect of our religion, living as a Pharisee. And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I'm on trial today. This promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God, serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it was because of this hope that these Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? 
I too was convinced that I ought to do all things that were possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Listen to what he said. The first thing I want to talk to is about being persuasive. I want to talk to us, how do we influence people in wherever God has put us? I don't know, maybe where you feel like you're in the wrong place, you're in the wrong job, you're around the wrong people. I don't know what, where you are in life. Maybe in the military, you feel like you got passed over for promotion and you should not be where you are. But can I tell you, maybe God is bigger than you think. Maybe God is more strategic than you realize. Maybe you feel like you shouldn't be working where you are any longer. Maybe you kind of feel like you shouldn't be where you are today and you're kind of living in regret and you're living and remorse, and you're living in, in just heaviness and sorrow and sadness and depression. Can I just talk to you about the Apostle Paul for a minute? And here's the first thought. Never underestimate the opportunities to talk to people about Jesus. Listen to what Paul said. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to be able to stand before you today. Well, what would it mean to be fortunate to stand before him? He was beaten, imprisoned, accused. But he didn't go down the world of, I didn't get the pay raise. I didn't get the opportunity. I didn't get the recognition. I didn't get the promotion. No, I am so blessed to have the opportunity to be standing in front of you. And maybe God has got a mission for you where you are. I just want to ask you, how's your perspective? Just recently, we were flying in an airplane somewhere and somebody was talking about how their seat didn't recline and how annoying it was for five hours in an airplane that their seat didn't recline. Now, I get you. You pay for a seat. The seat should recline. But I said to them, have you ever thought about the Apostle Paul when he's being shipwrecked? And we might want to c compare our complaints and put it in perspective. Can anybody say amen? Never underestimate the opportunity that is before you to talk to people about Jesus, no matter what the circumstance. Number two, watch this. We all have history and a reason to oppose Christianity. We all have history and a reason to oppose Christianity, don't we? I mean, even if you were born in church, you still have to have your God moment where you are questioning your faith till you find Jesus for yourself. And in that moment, you're opposing the things that maybe were taught to you by your parents. Maybe in that moment, and God is not, oh, God is not nervous. Oh no, they're questioning me. Maybe in that moment, you're even questioning the Bible. God's not going, oh no, they're questioning my word. Maybe in that moment, you're even questioning what the church is preaching and teaching. And God is not sweating it. Because God knows He has the answers. Come on, look at verse, verse 9. I too <coughs> was convinced that I ought to do all things that were possible to oppose the name of Jesus. And that is what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priest, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And I, I even was there when they were put to death. I cast my vote against them. Many a time, I went from one synagogue to another and had punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was obsessed with persecuting them. And, and even when I, I hunted them down and in foreign cities. Can I tell you something? Here's the second thought. I want you to catch it now. Listen to it carefully. Second thought is simply this. We all have history. And it seems to me, and the Apostle Paul was one of the chief persecutors of the New Testament church. But I've discovered, I just want to encourage you, never underestimate the opportunity God has for you to talk to people. Maybe God's got you right where you are because there's someone you're supposed to talk to and God's waiting for you to talk to them. But number two, listen to it. I want you to catch it. It's so important. I want you to catch it. We all have history and reason to oppose our faith in the past. And it seems to me, the more somebody resists, the closer they are. And maybe you feel like in the natural, this is getting harder and harder and worse. But it seems to me, like the Apostle Paul, he went out of his way. And the more he fought it, the more he was getting into it. I remember this one guy I was witnessing to. He was a terrible, terrible 
hopeless, alcoholic, could not get his life together for everything. And he, and he was a dear friend of mine. And he was lost with alcohol and his wife with prescription drugs. And I did everything I could to talk to this guy about Jesus. His parents were very wealthy and he kind of grew up somewhat of a special entitled life. And, you know, life wasn't going well for him. And he'd been in and out of detox units. And the more I talked about Jesus, the more violent he got with me, the more aggressive, even to the point where the parents say, Steve, I think you may need to back off. And I said, no, 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 he's getting closer. The harder you throw something down, the higher it bounces back. I said, I honestly believe he's this close. Well, then one night he just decided he was going to take his life. And he went in and took all these drugs that were completely, like would have killed him for sure. He took the whole bottle and he rang me up and he goes, let me tell you what I think about Jesus. I'm going to go meet him face to face. I don't want to be a Christian. I don't believe in your God. I've just overdosed and I've been drinking alcohol to go with it. He goes, I'll be dead in about 30 minutes. And I said, I'm coming over. I drove over to his house. There was a bottle empty of all the pills that he'd taken. And I remember thinking, dear God, his eyes were rolling over the back of his head. And I said, Graham, look at me, my friend. This is not the end of you, my friend. And then he realized what he'd done. He said, Steve, pray for me. I said, I will. And he was slipping in and out of consciousness. Of course, I rang an ambulance straight away. And I just said, in the name of Jesus, you will not die. You will live. In the name of Jesus, you will not die. And I literally, as he slipped in and out of consciousness, waiting for the ambulance, I ran the ambulance before I even went to the house. I don't know why the ambulance took so long that day. But I led him in a prayer of faith. And he gave his life to Jesus. And then he goes, I think I'm going to die. You don't understand. I took all of them. I knew what I was doing. And I just began to pray in the Holy Spirit. And guess what happened? He is stoned off his face in an overdose. And he gets filled with the Holy Spirit. They took him to the hospital. The hospital said, it's too late. The drugs have already diluted into his system. We don't think he's going to make it. To their shock and to their horror and to their amazement, this great young man made a full recovery, not without some some challenges in, in the consequences of it. And do you know what he became? He became the chaplain to one of the professional football teams in Australian Rugby League and was getting in the face of these footballers. Can I tell you something? We've all got a history to oppose our faith. But it seems to me the people who are opposing you the most are often, you never know, are the ones that are the closest. Listen to the Apostle Paul as he talks to King Agrippa. Look at the next thing he says. I love this. He goes in verse 12, he goes, on one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus. One of what journeys? The journey of opposing Christianity. The journey of putting people in prison. The journey of killing Christians. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority commission of the chief priest. And about noon, King Agrippa, I was on the side of the road. I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing all around me and my companions. And we all fell to the ground. That's called being slain in the spirit. The glory of God, the presence of Jesus, they all went out under the presence of God. It's in the Bible. Can anybody see it? Can anybody see it? So don't freak out if you see it in church. It happened in Paul's day. And he says, and then a voice came to me in Aramaic saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goats. And then I asked, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. And he said, now get up and stand on your feet for I have, he says, he says, I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness for what you have seen and what you will see of me. And I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. And I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God, so they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Can I tell you, I just want you to catch it. Here's the third thought. We all must tell our story of how we encountered Jesus. And here is the Apostle Paul. This is the third time he's told it. The first time he said a bright light. 
The second time he told it, it was a very bright light. The third time he tells it, it was a a light brighter than the sun. It seems to me the more he told the story, the clearer it got. The more powerful it became to him. He wasn't just going, well, here I go again, telling somebody else how I met Jesus. I don't know that you want to listen. I suppose you're not interested. No, no, no. Paul, every time he told his story, it got louder and bolder. And I want to say this summer, we all have to tell our story. Come on, church, we got to tell our story. Sometimes to the very people that we're praying God gets us out of, out of the very place that God put you there, because you haven't told your story yet. And don't worry if they oppose you. I think this is good preaching. We've all got to tell our story. Number four, watch this. In verse 19, so then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus, and then those in Jerusalem, and then in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preached that they should repent, turn to God, and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here today to testify to small and great alike. Here's what Paul's doing. I don't care who's listening. You might be the greatest, but I'm taking to the smallest. To that person standing over there, the court monitor, taking notes with a little chisel on a tablet perhaps, or a scribe, to anyone who's listening, anybody who's in earshot, I'm letting my story be told because if you don't listen, they might be listening. It doesn't matter. I'm telling my story. Come on, somebody. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets, this is the part I want to get to. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. I love Paul. Let me tell you something. So King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to this heavenly calling. Church, can I tell you, for us not to tell our story is disobedience to our heavenly calling. Here is the Apostle Paul. He says, I will not be disobedient to that. I just want to say this. Watch what what he's saying. What I'm telling you, King Agrippa, is something you're familiar with. You've heard of Moses. You've heard of the prophets. This is an age tried, tested, and proven message. Are you hearing it? Look at me, church. Don't look there. Look at me. Praise the Lord. Some of you are getting distracted right now. Look at me. Our story, can I tell you this? Our story is proven over history. Our faith in Jesus is proven over history. What we talk about is not some new fandangled way of doing things, but thank God from the God of the Old Testament right there in the beginning it was God and God created the heavens and the earth and everything that happened is by the will of God, by the plan of God, by the timing of God, by the purpose of God. And our story is proven over history. Can anybody say amen? Watch this one. He says in verse 24, at this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense, just like the devil tries to interrupt church services. He'll do anything to interrupt a church service for certain points of time, anything to get the attention off what God is doing. A crying baby. I'm not saying the devil makes a baby cry, but the devil sure loves it when one does because then a whole bunch of people, when somebody gets up in the middle of an altar call and walks out, The devil loves it. That person's just thinking about themselves. But the devil loves it because maybe somebody who's about to get saved that's almost persuaded suddenly goes, I'm under pressure. I'm joining the person who's leaving. The devil's smart. We are not, I'm not ignorant of his devices. Anybody ever know what it's like to invite somebody to the church and they say yes, and then some reason they have some disaster that happens the night before and they can't make it to church. Look what happens here, because Paul's talking to Agrippa, and look what the Bible says. At this point, at what point, when Paul's getting through, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You're out of your mind, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. He's not questioning whether Paul's intelligent, but your intelligence has drove you to insanity. And listen what it says. Paul replied, what I'm saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. You know what Paul did? 
you're not my audience right now, Festus. You're an interruption to the conversation I'm trying to have with the man. They can, if he meets Jesus, everything can change. Are you hearing me? And he goes, watch this. He goes, the king is familiar. And I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done. Watch this. In a corner. There'll always be a Festus when we talk to people about Jesus. The enemy will always bring someone in to interrupt the conversation. Maybe at a coffee break and you're just sitting down talking to somebody and all of a sudden you've got them right there and the devil will always see to it that somebody comes in to try and get that conversation away. Can I tell you, don't get discouraged when they oppose you. Don't get discouraged when, just when, when Festus comes in. It's a sign that you're getting through to somebody in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody give the Lord a hand. I think this is good insight. See, here's the thought. Listen to what happens here. Don't be afraid. Listen to this. The enemy will always try to distract people from the truth when you're making an impact. The enemy will always try to distract people from the truth when you're making an impact. Here's the next thought, because I've got to close. Don't be afraid to call people to a point of faith. And that's what Paul did with King Agrippa. And King Agrippa said, listen to this. Do you believe the prophets? I know you do. King Agrippa, Paul said, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then King Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time, you can persuade me to become a Christian? Another translation says it this way, thou almost persuadest me. But I love this translation because it says, do you think in such a quick conversation that you could persuade me, that you could convince me, and listen what Paul's answer was. I love it. He goes, well, he goes, he goes, well, King Agrippa, all I can tell you is um, short time or long time. Verse 29, I pray to God that you not only, but all those who are listening to me today may become what I am. I love that. Listen, he says, well, short. Some people say, do you think you can talk me into a Christian in just two minutes? Well, whether it be in two minutes or whether it be over a lifetime, I'm going for it. And Paul was not afraid. This is the point I want to make. I want to close with this. Paul was not afraid to come to call him to a point of faith. Would you make that decision? And the king goes, do you think it's such a short conversation? Well, what Paul's saying is everything I've said to you is proven over time. What I've said to you is proven. You know the prophets. You know the stories. You heard my story, how God saved me. And whether it be a short time or be a long time, it doesn't matter. But I pray not only you, king, but everybody listening to me. Never underestimate the power of people listening to you. I was in First Colony Coffee Shop many years ago, and I was supposed to be meeting a pastor to have a coffee with him. And I sat down, and I got there a little early, and this total stranger walked up to me, and she said, excuse me, I don't know who you are, but can I please talk to you? And I cut on, okay, have a seat. She sat down. She started to tell me the story about what was happening in her life and, and the problems she was having in a marriage. And I said to her, and of course, I quickly made sure she saw my wedding ring. I quickly made sure she knew I was a pastor of a church. And then she really seemed like this was a God moment. And I said, hey, listen, can I just tell you, there's hope for you. There's, you need to meet my wife. She's amazing. We have this thing with the women that we can help you. And we, your marriage can be healed. There's hope for you. And I shared with her and I prayed with her. Nothing real crazy. I didn't say, okay, now I'm going to lay hands on you. Are you ready to receive? Oh, I, we're in a coffee shop. I just said, Lord, I just pray for my sister. Help her. Thank you, Lord. She came. Thank you, Lord. She saw not me, but such she saw you in me. And I prayed and I said, I want you to call my wife. As I'm talking to her, a lady sitting next to me says, excuse me, can I talk to you? I heard you talk to that lady. You don't know who you're talking to sometimes. And so I said, sure, take a seat. And she jumped over and jumped in that seat. Meanwhile, the pastor arrived. So I said, I'm busy, just take a seat. And I start talking to her and she's telling me the problems she's having with the children and just, you know, just parenting and behavior and knowing what's where are the right boundaries. And I started talking to her, you should meet our children's pastor, the best children's pastor in all the world. He's amazing. 
And I prayed with her. As I'm praying with her, another single mother walks in to get a coffee who's a hairdresser on a coffee break. And she hears me talking to this mum and says, excuse me, I heard you talking to her. Can I please talk? You said, sure, take a seat. And she starts telling me about a child that has special needs with autism. I said, I know there's families in our church who are navigating the same thing. You're not alone. I'd love to introduce you to people. Can I just tell you, you don't know the floodgates of heaven God will open. And I want to make sure this summer that we don't just think about our summer vacation and think about what we're going to do. Can I tell you, Wave Church was born and created to see people come to faith in Jesus. And let's make sure we tell people our story. Come on, somebody, Seaboard Road, get on your feet and give God praise. Thou almost persuadeth me. Church, let's be people who are persuasive. This summer, let's go out of our way to tell people about the love of God. Let's tell people our story. Don't back off when they oppose you. Stay standing. I think maybe this is why Paul wrote this in Romans 8. Who shall separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Come hell or high water, come resistance, opposition, come laughter, come mockery. Nothing's going to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And if that means it's hard at work and I'm persecuted and it's perilous and it's hard, I am like my Saviour. I was born for the moment of telling people what it's all about. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angel nor demon nor principality nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor the height or the depth or any created thing shall separate me from the love of God. I am persuaded. I am persuaded. King Agrippa was almost persuaded. He was almost saved. He was almost delivered. But Paul was persuaded. And I pray today that we are persuasive. Can you say amen, church? Stay standing.